All right, what the fuck is up? Welcome back. My name is Noah Hills. You can find me on Twitter at Noah More Parties. And today's video is a look into one of the more interesting players, in my opinion, at least more interesting running backs in the player pool in fantasy football this year. And a guy who, before I kind of dove into this research, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do because there are a lot of positives about him and there are a lot of questions surrounding his situation. And that's Antonio Gibson. Let's do it. Uh, let's let's hop in our time machine to start off back to spring of 2020, shortly after the Washington football team had selected Antonio Gibson in the third round of the NFL draft. Coach Ron Rivera said shortly after that, and this is a quote, he's a little bit bigger than Christian, referring to Christian McCaffrey, but he's got a skill set like Christian. He's shown some position flexibility playing in the slot, then he shows position flexibility playing in the backfield. This is a very versatile young football player that we really think is going to be a guy that can get on the field for us early and contribute. I think we all know about this back when this was said, like there was a lot made of Ron Rivera comparing Antonio Gibson to Christian McCaffrey. I mean, that's kind of a wild comparison, but there were like some legitimate reasons why that comparison made sense. Like Antonio Gibson has a wide receiver background. He played wide receiver in college, um, didn't really play running back. He's an athletic dude, explosive athlete. And so, you know, the the superficial pieces are there for him to serve in some sort of like Christian McCaffrey type role. And he's been fairly successful, you know, as a, a real life NFL contributor and as a fantasy producer so far in his career. Now, fast forward to May of this year, May 2022, Ron Rivera, after the Washington now commanders selected Brian Robinson in the third round of the NFL draft, Rivera said, Brian Robinson is going to add very nicely to what we have with Antonio Gibson in terms of a one-two punch. A lot of success that I've had as a head coach has a lot to do with a quality one-two punch. We had Jonathan Stewart and D'Angelo Williams in Carolina in my first four seasons. We were very successful with that, so we feel really good about who this combination, this tandem, can be for us moving forward. So we've gone from, you know, peak hype coach speak in... You know, prior to Antonio Gibson's rookie year, he's being comped by his head coach to Christian McCaffrey to now two years later, you know, in spite of like legitimate success that he's had on the field and as a fantasy contributor, now his coach is comparing him to like D'Angelo Williams, maybe with Brian Robinson coming in here and being comped to Jonathan Stewart, or at least, you know, kind of the roles, the the distribution of the workload in this backfield being compared to those guys. That's, you know, D'Angelo Williams is a good player. Jonathan Stewart was a good player. They're not Christian McCaffrey. So we've we've gone from this guy's going to be Christian McCaffrey for us to this guy's going to be a good half of a one-two punch for us. That's, that's quite the dip in expectations, even in the face of, like, quality production from Antonio Gibson. But what I want to, you know, kind of focus on here is in what ways does Brian Robinson, you know, quote, add very nicely to this one-two punch with Antonio Gibson and I think it's it, it's clear to me, at least, that Brian Robinson was brought in here because he does all the little unsexy things really well. He's, number one, reliable on the ground. Um, I like to measure running back performance by, like, you know, kind of adjusting things for the context of the offense that they're, that they're playing in. And so comparing their efficiency to, like, the collective efficiency of the other backs in the team is a way we can get some insight into who's, you know, producing successfully, who's efficient on their carries you know, given the context of the offense that they're in. And while Brian Robinson was not efficient overall during his time at Alabama, his box adjusted efficiency rating was 94.6%, indicating that the average carry for Robinson, given the box counts that he's seeing and relative to his teammates, was worth 5% less than the average carry for other Alabama backs during his career. So less efficient than the other backs at Alabama. That's in the eighth percentile for running back prospects um, who would go on to be drafted since what? 2007, but since, you know, I have box count data, so going back to 2018, um, in the 8th percentile. But his relative success rate, which adjusts things in the same way as box-adjusted efficiency rating, but instead of measuring overall efficiency, measures how often is he just gaining a requisite amount of yards given down a distance. So how, how often do his runs result in successful plays? And so if it's second and eight, and he gains six yards, that's a successful play because it gained a good amount of yards that sets them up nicely for the next down, but... It, it's marked as a success whether he got six yards on that play or 15 yards on that play. So takes 
efficiency out of the equation and just looks at like the rate at which you're successful, just kind of like consistency on the ground. He's, he's doing that 5% more often than other backs at Alabama, which is in the 71st percentile. So low ceiling, really high floor output from Brian Robinson on a per carry basis throughout his career at Alabama. He was really reliable despite not offering much juice, like above and beyond, you know, kind of what he's getting in order to make runs successful. On top of reliability on the ground, he's a he's a good pass blocker. Um, at the Senior Bowl um, practices, he was named the running back of the week for the, I think he was on the American team, um, received a lot of praise for his performance in pass blocking drills. You can search him up on Twitter, um, Brian Robinson Senior Bowl, and see people hyping up his, you know, his stature, um, him looking the part, him putting people on their asses in pass blocking drills. Like, I think NFL coaches see things like that and latch onto the idea that like this is a guy who can, you know, protect our quarterback, who can play on third downs, given that, you know, he can he can do the little dirty things well in order to make our offense successful. And then he also is really good at ball security. In 597 career touches at Alabama, he fumbled zero times. And his career catch rate at Alabama was 85%, which is in the 82nd percentile. So He's got good hands as a receiver. He doesn't put the ball on the ground as a rusher. He pass blocks well, or at least he gives that impression through like things at the senior bowl. He gives that impression to NFL coaches and he's reliable on the ground, you know, objectively successful on his carries at a very high rate relative to really, really talented teammates at Alabama. And those things kind of combine to make Brian Robinson the anti-Antonio Gibson. I think Antonio Gibson is a good player. He's a dynamic athlete. He's explosive. But these things that Brian Robinson does well are the things that Antonio Gibson maybe does not. And if we look at reliability on the ground, Antonio Gibson has had an 80th percentile or higher volatility rating on his carries in both of his seasons in the NFL. And what that means is where Brian Robinson is not producing very efficiently, but he's successful on a large amount of his carries, his volatility rating is very low. It's like very you know, the standard deviation of the outcomes of his carries is very tight. Where for Antonio Gibson, he's been efficient, but like really low success rate. And so the disparity between those, you know, kind of paints a picture of a really volatile per, per carry runner that is, you know, producing efficiently overall, but maybe not reliable on a down-to-down -down basis. And that was especially true of him in short yard situations last season. His box adjusted efficiency rating just against eight and nine man boxes. So against the heaviest boxes in obvious running situations, those are often short yardage situations. His box adjusted efficiency rating was 63 and a half percent. So the average carry for Antonio Gibson last season against, you know, heavy, heavy boxes in short yardage situations was worth almost 40% less than the average carry for all non-Gibson runners in Washington in the same situations. And his relative success rate against those box counts was almost 2% lower than the collective other backs in Washington. So he's less efficient and less successful than his teammates in short yardage, in, in heavy, you know, defensive front situations last season. And if you look at just his, his carries on the goal line, within five yards of the end zone, his touchdown rate on those carries was 41.7%, which was which ranks 13th out of 17 running backs in the league last year who had at least 10 goal line carries. Gibson had 12 converted, I believe that's five of them into touchdowns, 41.7% rate, you know, below average for a high volume goal line runner. And while, you know, like Jonathan Taylor's rate in the same situations was like 42.3%. So I don't personally think this says something bad about Antonio Gibson's ability, but if you're Ron Rivera looking at these things, you, you can just kind of, by watching the film, by, you know, getting a sense of how he's playing throughout games and throughout the season, you know he's a volatile runner, you know he's not successful in, in short yardage situations, and you see him getting stuffed on the goal line more frequently than he's converting, even if that's not a bad thing in the context, you know, even if he's not, like, playing badly in those situations in the context of, like, the rest of the league, it might feel to you that he is when you're, you know, in there experiencing it. And so that opens the door for thinking like, oh, we need a guy in here who can like convert these situations, be reliable as an inside runner in short yardage. That's Brian Robinson. As a pass blocker, Antonio Gibson was the 142nd ranked pass blocker among running backs in 2020 as a rookie, according to Pro Football Focus. I found that on a tweet on Twitter. I don't have access to that information at PFF, but I found that on a tweet. I couldn't find um, pass blocking grades for Antonio Gibson for 2021, but 
a Twitter search also indicates that he was unimpressive there last year. I, and, you know, he's been playing running back for only two years. He played wide receiver in college. It's not really his fault that he's not yet some sort of excellent pass blocker, but it's just the reality of the situation. Like, he's not, you know, a positive contributor there at this point in his development. And then ball security. Antonio Gibson fumbled six times on 300 touches in 2021, the most fumbles of any running back in the league, several of them coming in very costly situations for Washington, given the game situations that they came in. So volatile runner on a per carry basis, hasn't been successful in short yardage and at the goal line, even if that's, you know, kind of like a fluky stat, you know, not a, a well-developed pass blocker at this point, and he put the ball on the ground quite a bit last season. All of those things contribute to, like, this sense in the Washington coaching staff that, like, we need to get a guy in here who can complement Gibson as a, like, reliable dude who's not going to make mistakes. And even if it's not necessarily fair, and even if I don't agree with those conclusions from, like, a player eval standpoint, you can see why Washington might view Brian Robinson as, like, a complement or a solution to the ways in which Antonio Gibson struggled last year, even though... He was a positive contributor overall. And then there's the J.D. McKissick part of this whole thing. Like I said, Antonio Gibson played wide receiver in college. He's theoretically a good receiving back, and he's been solid there so far as a pro. In 2020, as a rookie, 44 targets. Um, he was running a, a high amount of like basic routes, represented a, a large portion of his overall route tree, like swing passes, screens, and things like that. He wasn't asked to be, he wasn't asked to do like a lot of complicated things as a rookie, um, but he was targeted at a very high rate given the routes he was running um, on on relatively low route participation. Like he wasn't he wasn't running a lot of routes, he wasn't running a lot of different routes, but he was successful on the routes he was running and being targeted at a high rate. Like he he wasn't doing anything wrong as a receiver as a rookie. Last year, similar, but he expanded his role. He had 52 targets, 37% route participation, up from 29% as a rookie, and the amount of, of basic routes that he was running went down from 74% to 61%. The diversity of his route tree increased quite a bit, and while he was targeted at a lower rate than he was before, he was still targeted at an above average rate, you know, relative to league-wide, you know, targets per route run, given the routes he was running. So he got more responsibilities as a route runner last year, and he was still targeted at a high rate and participated in more, you know, passing snaps than he did the year previous. The problem is that J.D. McKissick is just a better receiver and has been more involved in this passing game as a result. He's had a more diverse route tree than Antonio Gibson in both seasons they've played in Washington together, a higher, like, per-route target rate, given the routes that he's running, than Antonio Gibson in both years, and a higher route participation rate than Antonio Gibson in both years. Uh, in 2020, Gibson participated in 29% of the passing snaps in Washington. J.D. McKissick participated in 64% of them. Last year, Gibson participated in 37% of the passing snaps. J.D. McKissick ran routes on 60% of them. That was the third highest rate for J.D. McKissick in both seasons league-wide. He, he had the third highest route participation in 2020 and the third highest route participation in 2021. He's an excellent receiver who is very heavily involved. And and what we see from this is that like while, while Antonio Gibson is theoretically well-built to do all of the things that we want our fantasy running backs to do, like, like at a base level, we want our guys to be like big, athletic, and catch passes. Antonio Gibson has those things. We want, we want targets from our fantasy running backs. Antonio Gibson played wide receiver in college. He should theoretically be very involved in the passing game. We want our fantasy running backs to get high volume as a runner and to get touchdown opportunities. And Antonio Gibson is athletic. He's been efficient as a runner, and he's got good size. Like, he theoretically fits the mold, you know, at least superficially, of a guy who looks exactly like, like, like a prototype fantasy scorer at the running back position. The problem is that he's already the second receiving option just in the backfield, given that J.D. McKissick is here in Washington. So that's one big part of the puzzle gone from, like, Antonio Gibson maximizing his potential as a fantasy contributor. The, the receiving portion is just, like, not available to him to the full extent it could be right now. And then his struggles with like the more nuanced aspects of just like playing the running back position might have lost him the parts, you know, some of the volume, volume rushing and touchdown scoring parts of this like greater puzzle to him being a, a high-end fantasy contributor. And so if McKissick is the preferred passing option, and if Robinson has been brought in to provide like reliable inside running, then Antonio Gibson is a committee runner with limited access to the highest value touches that, that running backs need in order to maximize their fantasy potential. And Ron Rivera has, like, alluded to this 
in talking about this backfield so far this season. He alluded to it being a one-two punch. He alluded to it being a, a committee distribution of touches. And in talking about Brian Robinson, he said, and I quote, now it's going to give Gibson an opportunity to get out in space, and that's what he does best. He makes people miss, and he's sneaky fast. Which sounds good and might be like an optimal real-life deployment of the running backs in this offense, but it's not good for fantasy football if Antonio Gibson is much more limited to just like, let's get him out in space, and he's no longer being trusted to like, handle the heavy work between the tackles, when we already know that he's not the most trusted option in the passing game among these running backs. All of that is true. And then there's also the Carson Wentz issue. Graham Barfield fired off a tweet um, earlier today, actually, that compared the um, on-target uh, passing rates of Carson Wentz and Matt Ryan to kind of draw a dichotomy between like what we could expect in the Indianapolis passing game versus what we saw last year. You know, it doesn't really matter about Matt Ryan for our purposes here, but I, I thought to take those numbers from uh, Barfield's tweet about Wentz and also look into Taylor Heineke's performance in the same metrics. From a clean pocket last season, Carson Wentz's percent of attempts that were like on target. His on target rate on clean pocket passes was 77%, which is 30th in the league. Taylor Heineke's on target rate on clean pocket throws was 80%. On non-screen, so all non-screens, Carson Wentz's on-target rate was 69%, 31st in the league. Heineke's on-target rate on the same throws was 77%. When pressured, Carson Wentz's on-target rate was 59%, 26th in the league. Taylor Heineke's on-target rate, when pressured, was 69%. On deep throws, Carson Wentz's on-target rate was 56%, which is right, you know, kind of in the middle of the league, 16th in the league. Taylor Heineke's was 57%. So all of these, all of these different metrics, like clean pocket, anything but a screen, under pressure, deep throws, Taylor Heineke was more accurate, more consistently on target than Carson Wentz in every single one of them. And really, if, if you go and, and search up that Graham Barfield tweet, Taylor Heineke's performance in a lot of those metrics was on par with where Matt Ryan was. And so these are like a large drop down from where Taylor Heineke was as an accurate passer to where Carson Wentz likely will be given his his past performance. Because Wentz couldn't deliver on target throws, like Wentz's play last season resulted in the Colts offense running the ball more often than they would have liked. I addressed this in my Naeem Hines video from earlier this week. The Colts got away from their game plan, I think largely in part to Wentz's inability to like deliver an accurate football. I also think part of the adjustments they made to their offense was running less 11 personnel in Indianapolis than they did in 2020. They took a step down in three wide receiver sets. And my theory is that that, you know, if you're wanting to create like easier throws for a quarterback that's not, you know, accurate, what do you need to do? You need to get fewer defensive backs on the field. You need to get more box defenders so you can have like easier passing lanes, you know, run play action, um, look like you're going to run and then actually pass. Just create easier throws for your quarterback when he's not able to do those things on his own. And so that's my theory of why the Colts ran more 11 personnel last season than they did previously. Washington was tied for the second highest rate in 11 personnel in 2021. They ran it on like 75% of their snaps. With Wentz, if he kind of has the same effect on this offense, I don't know that he will, but it's possible. If he has the same effect in this offense where they like realize they need to scale things back, make these throws easier, and run less 11 personnel in order to give like Wentz some training wheels on these throws, maybe A, they run the ball more out of those more heavy formations, and or B, maybe Antonio Gibson is on the field for more pass attempts in order to like maintain the threat of the run in these heavier formations versus having McKissick on the field in obvious passing situations with more wide receivers in the formation. I don't know if that happens. I think it's a possibility and it could be a good thing, but I think that the returns, even if that happens, are diminishing when this is ultimately going to be a bad offense and Antonio Gibson shares in the most valuable roles as a running back are capped by A, his limitations, and B, the presence of other players on this backfield that fill in those gaps. He's currently being selected as the RB25 in the early seventh round on underdog, and I understand completely the hypothetical upside and like the appeal represented by an explosive running back still in his prime, available in like the sixth or seventh round. But the truth of the matter is that he finished as the RB18 last year on a points per game basis, like a mid RB2, while seeing the eighth most weighted opportunities in the entire league among running backs. He's unlikely to see that much work in 2022, given the presence of McKissick, given the new presence of Brian Robinson, and he's going to be on an offense that is still going to be pretty bad, which is why I would rather take shots on wide receivers in the 6th and 7th rounds and let somebody else pull Antonio Gibson out of the running back dead zone. Yeah.